good morning. I guess good afternoon to everyone there. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with Dr. McDonald to share this exciting new patient resource with you. Um, a quick look at our disclosures. And I'd really like to begin by gratefully acknowledging our project advisory committee and our partner organizations, Canadian Cardiovascular Society, Canadian Heart Failure Society, the Heart Life Foundation, uh, UHN Peter Monk Cardiac Center and the Heart Hub, as well as the many patients, caregivers and clinicians who reviewed earlier drafts of this guide for us. Our three key learning objectives today include, first, the importance of patient engagement in their care. Secondly, to describe the Canadian Heart Failure Guidelines. And third, to encourage and empower patients to self-advocate. I'm going to begin by giving you a brief overview of the patient experience, an introduction to the Heart Life Foundation, and our role in co-creating this new resource. I was diagnosed with heart failure when I was 48 years old. Every single area of your life is impacted by a heart failure diagnosis. Simple things can suddenly take a major toll and even your friends and loved ones are left wondering, what does this all mean? A heart failure diagnosis brings uncertainty, fear, a sense of losing control and a sudden awareness of your own mortality. But that said, on the bright side, heart failure care is improving each year, and we need to consider both the individual's quality of life expectations and the mechanisms to empower patients and families with the right tools and resources. It's important that patients who are competent and able to self-manage their care are given the tools to do so. And by understanding each patient's needs and expectations and developing their self-management skills, we can learn to navigate through a hard diagnosis to a meaningful quality of life. Empowering patients was a key impetus to the formation of the Heart Life Foundation. We were founded and are led by two heart failure patients uh, with a mission of engaging, facilitating, and advocating for better care for all Canadians living with heart failure. I really encourage you to check out our website um, and refer your patients for resources and peer support. Um, but this belief in empowerment ultimately led to the development of our award-winning Heart Failure Patient and Caregiver Charter. The charter outlines rights and responsibilities to support the creation and the implementation of a national standard of care for Canadians living with heart failure and their caregivers. It has been endorsed by Global Heart Hub affiliates in over 30 countries and translated into 17 languages. So today we're going to highlight a collaboratively developed guide that aligns with the Heart Life Patient Charter, I'm very happy to say that, and has been created to support heart failure patients through their health journey. The guide has been developed to help patients understand heart failure medications, foster better conversations between patients and their healthcare teams, and help ensure patients receive the best heart failure care available. HeartLife was, was truly honored and thrilled to be invited to partner in this project from the early days. We had three people with lived experience on the team who played an active role throughout the creation of this guide. So I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and turn you over to Dr. McDonald, who will walk you through uh, the guide in more detail. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Tracy. We heard you loud and clear, and, and that was a wonderful uh, uh, setting of the table for the next few slides to, to finish this session off. So I may or may not have control of the slides now, but uh, we shall see. I do. So this is, this is really intended to be something a little bit innovative. There's not a lot out there in this space whereby we have a tool for patients to uh, self-advocate that they get uh, optimal heart failure care. And while heart failure care is comprehensive, it's pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic, multidisciplinary, we wanted to bite off a, a smaller piece of the puzzle and 
and really focus on pharmacologic therapy. If we can, if we can encourage and empower patients and, and caregivers to advocate for optimal pharmacologic care, that can have a that can have huge uh, favorable impact and and help close the gaps we've heard so much about. You've seen this slide three times already today. I'm not going to uh, go into too much detail, but uh, it is by by necessity an oversimplification of a very nuanced field. If we blow up the first tier, as others have, have said a few times, we now have four standard therapy drugs, which is, is game-changing as of 2021 from a guidelines perspective, uh, such that uh, there are strong recommendations with high quality evidence that patients um, in the absence of contraindications are on an SGLT2 inhibitor, a mineralocorticoid antagonist, a beta blocker, and either an ARNI or an ACE inhibitor, an ARNI being preferred if, if uh, we expect tolerance. So there you have it. Um, and then uh, once you have the foundational layer of therapy, um, then patients may have uh, an opportunity to further optimize and tweak their, their medications uh, with either sinus node slowing, older drugs like vasodilators or, or digoxin. And that's really driven by clinical factors. And this is, again, where primary care colleagues may work closely with the specialist to navigate patients through this part of their medication prescription same or similar data that Darshan had shown earlier, and this is why we beat the drum so hard. This is why we're so bullish on, on heart failure therapies, because they do save lives, and each one incrementally improves prognosis. This is Canadian, a Canadian slide put together by colleagues in Calgary that really look at one-year mortality, and each, an adi each additional drug that you add shaves off absolute percentages of, uh, of mortality risk within that first year. And uh, again, this is a, another graphic from that CHAMP registry that, that others have talked about. And, and not only are absolute rates of medication prescription suboptimal, in fact, very poor at a population level, but when you look at what happens to patients over time, in this registry, it's about 3,500 patients in the U.S. with heart failure, reduced EF. Not only were the baseline prescription rates poor, but when you follow these patients in their natural environment, of what happens to them 12 months later, not a lot of action. So very small incremental changes in the proportion of patients on good medications. That speaks to the huge gap that Darshan alluded to earlier. And again, we've heard a lot about challenges. Um, Dr. Van Spall talked about challenges. Darshan talked about challenges. Um, this is my version of, of uh, how we can get into challenges, but it, the message is the same. Really, we do nothing else except aim to make our patients live longer and feel better. And we do that by optimizing their medical therapy and timing interventions and, uh, and uh, procedures. Uh, appropriately and we refer uh, for an appropriate time and place. We also want to maintain health to keep patients out of hospital and that often involves figuring out a strategy to uh, navigate our patients or monitor them in between clinic visits, this concept of remote monitoring. But of course we have lack of knowledge and uh, social barriers that are very real and pervasive. We have therapeutic inertia both on the parts of patients who don't want to take more medications and physicians who don't want to uh, take the time it takes to prescribe medications if the perceived incremental benefit isn't there. There's patient reluctance, real contraindications, cost which is massive, and uh, pandemics don't help anybody for anything. So we really want to look at closing this, this gap, and this, the idea behind this uh, patient and caregiver guide was just as another tool, another approach to translate knowledge into, into action. So our goals with this, uh, as Tracy alluded to, is really to develop a tool to help patients and caregivers advocate for optimal care, complement existing out efforts from uh, society, major societies and patient advocacy groups like HeartLife, Focus on the most important messages in a practical, informative uh, way in an appropriate medium. This is a collaborative effort, as you've already seen, and, and Tracy outlined the different, uh, the different groups that came to the table. And those of us that were involved in this, you see the author list there. I won't read through everybody's role, but uh, people wore different hats and came at this at, to the table from different perspectives. So it was a really wonderful coming together uh, of, and just because you have heart failure cardiologists who think they know everything always all the time, you really learn a lot from all the inputs that come in uh, about what's really helpful uh, for patients and people with lived experience. 
And so what does the final product look like, soon to be released? And, uh, and it looks like this. And, uh, and the guide covers uh, in, in uh, fairly succinct format, uh, what, what are the medication choices? What are the side effects of the medications? What is the rationale for optimal medical management? Uh, how do we get there? And then what happens afterwards? Not, not to say that the job is done just with medication prescription. Uh, this is a, another a sample graphic from the guideline, uh, and you can see that it's, it's not as heavy on the text, that uh, there was a lot of graphic design that went into this from our graphic design experts, uh, just trying to visually represent uh, different aspects of the heart failure journey as it relates to medication titration. And then sort of clarifying why no two patients may be the same in terms of how they get to be exposed to the different medications at different times and how our medications increase. They're titrated uh, stepwise. Sometimes we have to peel back and no two patients can expect to have the exact same uh, exact same route to get to the same uh, point necessarily. Uh, so what are the next steps with, with the guide? Well, we're, we're going to put it out into the world and see what kind of feedback we get. Um, we're, it's going to be translated and we'll have multiple uh, multimedia versions of it, looking at different channels and education initiatives uh, from different partner organizations. This is, to my knowledge, the first time we've ever talked about it in a public uh, scientific forum. Uh, we're going to engage different uh, collaborators like the CCS, Canadian Cardiovascular Society Advocacy Group. This will have some play at the Heart Failure Awareness Week. And most importantly, we're going to get feedback. Um, this is the first launch or first, uh, first time we've taken or that I'm aware anyone has taken this kind of approach to a guideline um, uh, adjunct. And we're going to improve it. We'll expand it and go into other territory as it relates to the, the guidelines. So in summary... Uh, lived experience can and should inform clinical guidelines. It provides a, a critical perspective and increases, I think, uh, the accountability as we're crafting the guidelines and thinking about how we translate knowledge into practice. It's an opportunity to enhance self-advocacy. It's, uh, we do have excellent heart failure care guidelines from a number of societies, including our own, uh, but translation into clinical practice certainly lags and uptake is suboptimal. So coming at this gap from a number of angles seems to make sense. And our patient and caregiver guide is a, is a novel tool, really, to improve quality of heart failure care and bridge these gaps. Uh, and it's an additional level of engagement from people with lived experience and content experts. Uh, and we anticipate that this will be scalable, and we hope that it will increase uh, effectiveness of, of guideline translation. So with that, we'll end and uh, look forward to the discussion.